Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike like Clayton here from XY. Have the privilege, nay, the pleasure of finally securing the guest of Harry. Mate, how are you? Well, like I said before, uh, Clayton, I feel uh, I'm the privileged one because uh, I'm sitting here um, in my humble hobbitness. Um, with the grand Hugo boss of the world. <laughs> that is so brutal. But uh, I'm going I'm to somehow interpret that as a compliment. Thank you, good sir. It um, is. I, I promise you it's a compliment. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, I, the first time I sort of got to see your, um, your work ethic and your attention to detail was a fair few years ago now. And, um, and it was around some estate planning stuff. It was, it was certainly around some digital assets and you were sort of discussing things that needed to be discussed and no one else was discussing it. Um, you, you were sort of bringing these subjects into conversation when, I mean, let's face it, uh, financial planning is one of the most conservative and slowest moving industries. Unless, of course, you're the government, in which case then it apparently moves very rapidly. But beyond that, uh, it does take time. It does, um, we, we like to sort of stick to what we know. And you were discussing some really, uh, I guess, modern things like digital assets. Um, and that was the first time I sort of was introduced to, to the way that you think about things. And then I've sort of followed you from afar, you know, since that time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and even interestingly, you know, I, 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 you're one of the people that sort of reaches out the most and helps the most. And in fact, we had to organize this podcast at a time where the two interns in your office weren't, you know, you weren't going to miss out on helping them. And I just thought that was very sort of full circle for the way that you approach this stuff, mate. So um, let's, let's learn a little bit about Harry for once, shall we? Okay. So uh, what do you want to know, Clayton? How, 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 on earth did you, how did you get into advice? There's a gentleman by the name of uh, Peter Sobels who, um, is, um, who owns Risk, uh, Risk Info. And um, he asked me the same question during a similar sort of uh, interview um, at the MDRT in uh, Miami last year. And um, I'll say the same thing to you that I said to him. Um, as a 16-year-old kid many, many uh, moons ago, um, I was a, uh, I guess I was uh, destined to uh, do something in math science. So, um, you know, the Sheldon character from Big Bang Theory? Yes. That is uh, me. Um, <laughs> who, who, who knew that I was socially awkward in, in those days? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was, uh, um, was going to be a scientist and develop a cure, maybe for the beer virus that we've got now, but let's yeah. move on. <laughs> and, the beer um, virus. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, part of my very, very bad, socially awkward humour, but that's okay. We'll keep moving. <laughs> and um, uh, I, uh, we came across a, uh, I guess, a scenario. Me as a sixteen-year-old kid, where we had a long-lost relative um, from the village, um, from back, um, back in Greece, who entered our lives and sold um, uh, something to my family, to my parents. That was very good for him and not so good for our parents, not so good for our family. So, and he wouldn't leave uh, until we signed because that's how you did things back then. And this was a 16-year-old kid. This is 1987. Um, so we signed. Uh, we didn't know. Um, and then about um, 10 days later, the 87 stock market crash happened. So, and I distinctly remember my dear old dad uh, saying, see, if we had bought money, if we had bought some of that, we would have done our dough. They didn't even know. About uh, three or four days later, we received the welcome pack and um, there was no free look period. There was no advice, certainly no uh, external dispute resolution scheme um, that there is uh, these days back then. And we tried um, very much to get out of it, uh, but it very much operated on a buyer beware type uh, system. 
Um, and even when we tried to get out of it, um, we discovered that this particular person had loaded not only the, um, the upfront um, entry fees, but also the back end exit fees. So 10% upfront, 10% uh, exit, and the value of the exit fee was worth more than the value of the account. Um, so right then and there, yes, yeah, so I can see that look in your face, uh, Clay. Um, so you can imagine, um, I guess, uh, yes. So right then and there, I was quite horrified and mortified. Someone who had a, a right brain type attitude, you know, it's, a, it's about building a body of evidence. It's about building um, information, about uh, doing always what's in the best interest of not, not so much the client, but always building what's in the best interest of humanity. Um, and end of story, full stop, that's it. So I decided to um, um, move uh, my passion, my, uh, my destiny uh, from math science to, um, to this. And I was uh, determined that I was never going to let anyone do the same thing to other people. And, and here we are. Uh, let's say that was uh, when I was a 16-year-old kid. I recently turned 49. So that was 33 years ago. That is, <clears throat> that's the equivalent of... Uh... I've heard a few times the, the insurance story, the, the story where people didn't have the insurance and, you know, um, I haven't heard this one. This one is, uh, is equally as bad. You see a, a bunch of money being lost by a close family and that moment in time being a game changer. Yeah. That's uh mate. Did, did, did you, uh, did you take a tire iron to the guy's kneecaps? Uh, no, that? um, this guy, um, this particular person, went through all the friends and family in our village community here in Melbourne and um, uh, entered people's homes on the relationship and did the and you know, uh, swept through um, families, uh, dare I say, um, like a, a virus. Oh my goodness, yeah, it's. It's, um, there's one in a thousand I've, I, it might be more than that, but my view is now, um, having, you know, been with X, Y for a while, it, there's about one in a thousand people that are just not very good people. Um, and yeah, it's one of those things that if you, if you become the victim of them and obviously like there's, there's a lot of those out there if there's one in a thousand and then they have their sort of set victims that they like to go after. And mm. yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a real wake-up call. Um, Clayton, um, I refuse to play the victim. I refuse to be part of the pity party. I've never been like that. I was never brought up to be like that. The, the only way you fix things, the only way you change things is you change things from within. Yeah, And so you either step in and get uh, sucked in and uh, sucked up by the mire and quagmire that is bad news, or you um, step up and you try and make, um, you know, lemonade out of uh, lemons. Absolutely. And I fully, I, I mean, that's probably that, that, that uh, worldview, I think is something that um, was one of the things that I connected with you digitally, of course, um, when I when I was seeing you know the way that you were sort of helping such a huge amount of uh, other advisors, so um, the question becomes: so now I, now I understand why you're interested in seeing the positive evolution of financial advice is obviously because people, um, you know, the better that advisors are, the less likely that well I should say the more likely that people will get better advice, and the less likely people will get bad advice, and that's a that's a very good mandate. But so now diving in a little bit more, uh, you've got two interns. What's going yes. on there? Are they doing the professional year or what's going on? So not just yet because um, obviously there's a uh, process um, and um, in order, and I'm reading off, I've got the FASIA, um website up here at the moment. And in order to go through the, um, I guess, the professional year program, there's a structured program that we have to go through um, and, we're working through what that means um, so we can get an understanding uh, so we can provide a, a structure for them. And it's also, it's been a, as much a, um, a learning experience for us as practitioners um, as it is, as it has been, I guess, for them um, because we are, I believe we're learning just as much, not only about our, um, the business and how we do things, but also about ourselves. Um, and it's um, very much sort of dovetails into the estate planning and the estate administration piece because we want to make sure 
that we try and engage with the next generation. And here we are, we're employing the next generation and we have to get a, a sense of how they think, how they act, how they speak, uh, how they talk, um, why they talk. Um, and then they, at the same time, um, have to get an understanding of why we do certain things in certain ways. Um, so it really has been um, a fascinating journey, uh, I would like to say, for both, for both um, ends. Um, and the, I think um, with all the committee involvement that I've been in, for, in different um, avenues and different fields, this is something, uh, professional year, that I've been really pushing for and advocating for, you know, since I've started doing this all, this, all those years ago. Because if you think about it, um, you have a professional year or you would call it, I guess, articles for lawyers. And, you know, as an accountant, you have to, you know, process 10,000 tax returns before you get even to speak to clients. Um, in nurses and teachers, they have to go rounds um, in the medical um, um, fraternity, I guess. Even as a tradesperson, you have to go through an apprenticeship. Um, and even if you like, as a mortgage broker, there is a two-year mandated mentoring period where you are with a mentor um, so and you bounce different strategies off them. So why uh, something so important as financial planning has taken so long where government, it's been forced upon us by government um, to uh, have in place a professional year is beyond me. There's lots of practices out there that are that have already built professional year type programs, and I salute them. And all they really will have to do is tweak them because they already have their systems and processes in place anyway. And there, I be they, I believe, are the early adopters and the innovators because they were doing it before it was even a thing. Yeah. Um, and here we are. There are some interesting things that um, um, the FASIA PY uh, program um, uh, is putting forward to the profession which I think is great. And I'm probably going to disturb and, you know, the, the zero people who listen to this podcast. I'll listen to it to see you, Clayton, but not to see me. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. um, they, I believe, and my, my feeling is that um, if you see how advice is globally and how advisors are accredited and educated globally, I believe that the, system in Australia will get harder. I believe wow. that to become an advice professional in Australia, it will become harder. It will become more difficult. Of course, that'll mean it'll, it uh, may push out um, people who are already in, um, uh, in the industry, and I use the I word there as opposed to the P word, mm -hmm. but those people who, who stay or those people who, um, who, will, continue, or who will choose of what we do as, a, as a, an ongoing profession, and there's the P word, um, I think will be better for it. For the longest period of time, where, if you think about this, and if you think the example um, about how I became an advisor, it was all very much on soft skills. So we had the pendulum all the way this way. We had very much soft skills, very much on relationship, and very, very little, if any, technical. <laughs> and then we had all these... Um, scandals and inquiries and reviews and all sorts of stuff and everything. And the pendulum slowly swung this way where we, where the education system bred this entire cohort of a very, very technically adept, very, very technically and strategically aware um, candidates, but they had no soft skills. So yeah. I, I um, applaud um, Steve and the team at FASIA um, for building something that has as one of its key components um, behavioral finance yeah it's um, well in, in terms of the professional year I, I think the, the fact that you're even thinking about it with probably more clarity than in, than most conversations I have is a really good sign um, I'm interested in seeing the profession move forward and as, as most people are um, I'm, I'm very interested in, in seeing that the, uh, the professional year picks up the slack, which I guess was a, a bit of a hole. And, and, and if I think back to, you know, cause I actually came from tax accounting and into power planning and making the leap from that technical side into advice was really difficult because 
the facts are if I was really good at my job, people didn't want me to move on to become a financial planner. Why would you, if you're a financial planner, why do you want your assistant who's doing such a good job to, to move on? You, you actually, you want them to stay there. And then if I was bad at my job, then, uh, then you just get fired. <laughs> so getting into advice was really difficult. And I think that having a professional year, uh, sets, I would even say a good framework to attract uh, smart, intelligent, capable, ambitious, um, uh, what do you call them, uh, graduates from uni. It becomes, a bit, I, I think even putting the barriers up to entry makes it more appealing because prior to a professional year, it was, well, how did he become an advisor? And it was, oh, you know, you, you somehow try and get there. <laughs> and it's actually, there was no clear path. And this is a bit of a pathway. And so I definitely support it. Um, what are you doing or what are you anticipating or how are you uh, predicting that you're going to undertake this? Um, that's a fascinating question and it's uh, still a journey of discovery for us. Um, and we're still going through this um, ourselves um, to understand um, what um, the ins and outs and ups and downs of the professional year entail. We've looked at other professions um, and other vocations to get an understanding of what they do. And um, I think uh, I was at a conference a couple of years ago in LA and I was speaking to a, um, the, the thing that I voiced to the speaker uh, was, um, you know, there are all these um, people coming through the system, but they've got really great technical skills, but their soft skills are garbage. How do you do it? And this uh, gentleman, uh, and we broke up into groups, and this particular gentleman was in my group and he was a, um, a 72 years of age and what he wanted to learn. And this is a guy who's been, you know, he'd been in the, um, he'd been an advisor for some 52 years. Um, and what he wanted to learn, it was, you know, he was very, very keen and very, very interested to learn more about, to, to learn about prospecting. And I just sat there and I've gone, mate, <laughs> I've missed something here. You know, you know, here you are, you're successful. It's a qualification only conference. Um, and you want to learn about prospecting. We had, and after the, the workshop, that, that particular uh, workshop finished, I mean, we went outside for a cup. And then I explained to him the, the dilemma I was going through. And he said to me, so when you get, um, when you have these uh, newbies uh, come on board, what do you do? And back in the day, what you used to do is you had a filing cabinet of all these clients, AKA policy holders. And you were told, and I'm sure you remember this too, uh, Clayton, you were told, here's a whole bunch of contacts, off you go. And even before then, you were given a telephone book and you go, here you go, go and contact them. Yeah. And, you, and if you didn't sell, and if you didn't make meetings, you'd starve. But then if you look at how the, uh, the, the legal fraternity, the accounting fraternity, the, um, the, the education and medical uh, fraternity, um, mortgage broking, real estate agents, uh, apprenticeships, what they do is you, you, you get these um, new candidates into the system and they, they're put on the tools and they are soft introduced to clients. And over time, the, there's a handover process. But for some reason... Um, and I'll use the I word, the financial planning industry globally forgot that because we lost it. We lost the whole process of uh, best interest to humanity and about being sales. Mm. Now I get, and Baz Gardner talks a lot about this in terms of we all, you know, we're all old enough and ugly enough to realize that the S is not a dirty word. We do have to sell and the, um, the better practices, um, advice, uh, legal, you know, even doctors, you know, I've had some surgery on my hands here and I've spoken to my, um, uh, my hand specialist and even he realizes that a big part of his job is selling, uh, yeah. which is quite, which is quite fascinating. I, I felt. And this guy turned around and said, why aren't you, um, this guy in the States, why aren't you slowly passing on your safe clients, the clients that like you, the clients that you've been working with, the clients that don't, um, no one understand the, the sort of advice that you provide to the new people in the system. And you're the experienced one. You lead from, you lead from, um, um, from the front, from the front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brain. 
um, <laughs> and you go out and prospect. You te- you're, you're telling these people, you know, you have to build networks and you have to speak at these events and you have to do this and, you you know, you have to have these um, podcasts with the great Clayton <laughs> to, build the, uh, uh, to, to build the profile even more. Why aren't you doing this? And I just sat there and I've gone, we've got the whole paradigm wrong. We've got the, you know, the, our whole paradigm is, has always been based on sales and, you know, we, and we've talked about that and, we, and there's lots and lots and lots of material out about that. But unless you've got that, you know, one striking moment where someone, you know, uh, smacks a skill at the back of your head and really wakes you up and says, hello. And uh, unfortunately, this is why we've had so many um, inquiries and scandals and all sorts of stuff because it really has been based on sales. Yeah. No, and, and there's no argument there. And, and it's, um, it's come out of the, you know, the, the life, you know, the life agency prior and then yep. superannuation. And, and um, I've thought about this a lot, actually, and I'm getting a little bit clearer on my thoughts on this. Um, basically, prior to the internet and prior to the ability, uh, you know, for platforms like YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn and, and, and prior to ways of being able to get in front of others in a scalable way, um, yep. realistically, it was you can buy a logo and a, and, a, and, a, and a phone number in a yellow pages, right? And the, yep. the, uh, the skill set then became, well, I have one hour to get someone from not knowing me to trusting me to uh, uh, doing business with me. And because it was, I guess, immature as an industry and no one even knew what financial advice was. And so the skill set became, how do I do better with that upfront hour? These days, yes. uh, we, have, we have things like... Uh, you know, Facebook and podcasts and all these kind of things and your ability to get in front of clients on a regular basis uh, prior to that meeting has exploded. And so now, and now it's a case of putting out a specific message tailored for a specific audience uh, and, and constantly talking to them about their problems and how you can solve their problems. And then, and then people can get to know you and we're, we're in a position now where it's going to be hard to defend the idea that sales is now the main way to gain business. I, I, I feel like this, the whole purchasing paradigm, if you want to call it that, has shifted so much in favor of you know, people learning about what they want to purchase before they purchase it. That if now your skill set is simply, uh, please get into my office and then listen to me for an hour and then purchase of me. I think you, you, you're very close to being able to fall off the boat. And as a result of all of that, as a result, as this whole industry is moves further and further away from sales, I think, and I'm pretty certain I've got actually a pretty clear path towards this is that we're going to move from the I word to the P word. I think we're moving from the industry to the profession at the point where advisors receive tax deductions uh, or, or clients receive tax deductions for upfront advice purely based on the fact that an advisor gave them advice. Um, and that for me is, will be a line in the sand that I've been quite passionate about. I had a really big meeting yesterday and I'm really looking forward to actually starting to talk about the progress that XY has been making on this front, but it's kind of hard with all the different topics that are out there in the market at the moment. But as far as a line in the sand, I think that's a really good clear picture to aim for is, is the moment that the tax law says a financial advice providing advice is a tax deduction to the client. That for me is, uh, is, is something I'm quite passionate about. Um, and I think a part of that is Basia, right? I think a part of that is the elevation of professional standards. Interestingly, uh, the research, at least that I've looked at, and this is interesting, and I, it's kind of contrary to what I was expecting, but from what I've seen, the higher education does not equal higher ethics. That uh, that was actually a surprise to me. So. So scoping the E word out of FASIA for a moment, but at least, you know, putting the standard up maybe won't make people more ethical. I think there's many ethical frameworks and people will choose to use whatever framework that works best for them. And I'm sure most people think they're ethical anyway. Um, the, the difference, I guess, is having a higher education standard, I think for the long term is just going to draw in clearer pathways of better uh, graduates. And I think over the next sort of 20 to 30 years, 
our conversations are going to seem dinosaur-esque. It's funny you say that, Clayton, because I, I went to a PD. I took uh, one of the interns today to a PD day. Um, he's quite keen on also pursuing a uh, down the mortgage broking path. So we went to an AFG PD day. And we we're talking to some of the other advisors who were there as well. And all of the conversation with these other advisors were, you know, a bit of what I call the Antigone complex with me. The world's ended, you know, really is like a Greek. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the, the young fellow was looking at them, you know, looking at me and looking at them. And then when we finished the conversation and he kept uh, walking on and uh, he said to me, you don't talk like that. Um, around us and I said because I think that we're in the, the most amazing opportunity for financial advice in Australia in our history yeah and we can look at this uh, when once upon a time uh, when the great Bruce Lee was still around um, he was being interviewed and he was being asked about human mindset and human paradigm and opinion and uh, what he said to the interviewer he said let your, you know, your mind, you know, should be like water because water takes the, the shape of a, of, a, of a teapot. Water takes the shape of a cup or a glass. So have your mind like that and change your paradigm because it forms, it allows, you know, rather than be structured into a particular box, it allows to take the shape um, of anything that it's in. And this is very hard for, um, um, for many people who are part of the establishment. Now, you mentioned the, the D word before the dinosaurs. And we have to be very, we have to be very, very careful about um, ourselves being part of the dinosaurs, yeah. and um, and see how we can embrace um, the change that is upon us. And you know the whole the whole mechanism that is financial planning advice. If you think of the financial planning process, the last step in the financial planning process is review. And what does review mean? Stuff happens, life changes, and what do we do? We go all the way back again and start the whole process again. And yet. When we are faced with this, when we're faced with cultural change, education change, legislative, uh, regulatory change, and there's a young lass who's on XY, I believe, called Haley Pierce. And yes. I remember I was having a, a conversation with her at another event, and um, we were talking about things. And we, the, the V word, um, uh, I, I talked about the V word being volatility. And she, young Haley looked at me and said, I'm surprised that you use that word, Harry. And I said, which word? And she said, volatility. And I said, well, you know, I said, I know what it means, Harry, but I'm surprised you still use the word volatility. Like, Harry, what do you use? And she said, investment wobble. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, again, it's just thinking about different words because what does volatility <laughs> mean from a chemical? This is my Sheldon-ness I'm going into overdrive now. What does volatility, volatility mean? It means explosion. It means chemical reaction. It means people, you know, yeah, going on this beer virus and buy toilet rolls by the um, <laughs> by the Armageddon load, and all that happened is it just presents a uh, a buying opportunity. And I'm I I bet you London to a brick that there's a whole bunch of uh, very 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 wealthy investment houses who have been cashed up, who may be even shorted the market, um, and they're now um, taken a um, an interesting position where the markets have gone down. But you know that's a uh, my uh, uh, my conspiracy stories. I wanted to touch on something that you said a second ago about, yes. and I'll make some notes here because that's what we do, you know, as advisors. <laughs> you, you talked about the work that you and XY are doing about advice and tax deductions. Now, yes. one thing, again, it's just about, about changing the paradigm. Um, advice has been tax deductible from the word go. Yes. So part of the... Sometimes, you know, you, you hear these sayings and these parables and these uh, fables and stuff like that. You know, if a tree falls in the forest, did it ever happen? Yes. Now, if you think about this, people want to buy investment so it produces gain over the long term. And then at some particular point in time, um, you, you or the estate sells that investment and makes a profit. Well, how is the cost of advice any different to the buying cost on property. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's a capital. No, no, no. So I, again, I, I, I can definitely argue this. Nerdness. Yeah. No, definitely. My extreme geeky nerdness. I, I'm more than happy. I've thought about this um, substantially. So why I would say that the that um, a purchase price making up a capital base for an investment property differs uh, for upfront financial advice 
Um, first of all, one is a, a real asset uh, in terms of it is a physical uh, um, thing that grows in value and has a purchase and a sale price. Hold on um, there. Just, just hold on there, Clayton. Just hold on there. Certainly. certainly. So if, we look at it, if we look at that scenario, let's say from a legal or a valuation or um, surveying or an accounting perspective, yes. all of those costs there are buying costs and they, they add on to the buy price. Correct. At yes. Some particular point. So we just have to be better with our record, t- record keeping, isn't it, right? No, no, no. So uh, it's because um, financial advice um, doesn't have a specific addendum in the tax law to allow financial advice, upfront financial advice to be a tax deduction. And so as, as I was saying, uh, you've got all these different attributes that make up the, the, the capital base, base price. And then at a later point, you've got a sale price and then you take the sale price and you minus the, the cost base and there you have your, your capital gain. Uh, there is no sale price to the advice. There is, a, there is a benefit that is received as a result of advice, but there is no, the, I, can't sell, um, I can't sell my SOA on the market 20 years from now. I can't say, uh, this is the upfront piece of advice that I received. Um, I paid $2,000 for it in 2020. And now that it's 2040, it's now worth $10,000. It's not worth anything to anyone because uh, the benefit that I've received has been, uh, has been intangible. It has been behavioral based and it has, uh, by listening to the advice, sure, I have increased my, um, my capital base. However, I have no, um, capital expenditure that I can now deduct from the cost of, um, of my results. Um, I think that's a, that's a pretty clear argument. I would, the, the stuff that I've read and the stuff that I've done would say that um, it is a capital, it is a, uh, a capital cost. Yes, the that's the that argument. Capital cost. The, the argument is that it is a capital cost. Absolutely. And, and, and mm-hmm. I'm not disagreeing with you in the, in the mm-hmm. sense that that is how it is currently interpreted. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just saying it's bullshit. <laughs> I'm just saying I completely disagree with it. I'm, I, well, I'm saying that, that, it, that, 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 that is, it's completely irrational and, um, yep. and I want to see it change. That, that for me is a bit of a line in the sand, yeah. Well, well uh, let's talk about that then for a second. If you yep. think about who our regulators and um, which portion of which profession of the community has made up our um, our regulators and legislators, sure, um, sure. it's not been financial advisors. Yes. It's been people who had, um, I guess, what was uh, perceived by the community to be some sort of formal education. You know, it has been accountants. It has been lawyers. It has been architects. It has been engineers. Uh, medicos and the list of the list goes on. So until we gladly embrace this concept of education, there are some people now in Australia who are now moving on to PhD. There is a, a, um, wow. a raft of advisors in the both the US or overseas who've got PhDs. That's amazing. And their studies are absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And a lot of them are quantitative type studies. But there's, um, there's a beginning of qualitative type studies. For example, um, La Trobe University until very recently, I'm not sure whether you're aware of La Trobe in, um, in sunny Sydney, but La Trobe University until um, uh, recently, what they did as part of their mandatory curriculum for lawyers is not only do they want to produce uh, good lawyers, good public advocates, but they also wanted to make sure they were good corporate citizens as well. It's awesome. Because the, the, the machine that is the, um, the, the legal education uh, process, I guess, breeds a, uh, a cohort of candidates who um, are, let's perhaps say, um, you only make money when you litigate. Yeah. So what, um, what uh, Latrobe did is they introduced a mandatory subject of mindfulness. Oh, that's cool. How cool is that? That's really cool. And what they've done now is that there's a whole raft of studies in the legal fraternity to show 
how mindfulness makes uh, for better um, corporate citizens from the legal fraternity. And isn't mindfulness just a fancy word for behavioral finance? Yeah, that's a good, really, yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Now, it might be a long bone, mate, but, um, you know, as I said to you before, we had these great soft skills, but very not so good technical skills. We had these great technical skills, but not so good uh, soft, um, other way around. Yep. And with the pendulum sort of swinging in the middle, people think the pendulum's all the way up here, but I don't really think so. The pendulum's here. The opportunity is globally the, the most amazing opportunity. And there are advisors um, overseas who are continuing to open up branches and open up markets um, from their home base. There's one advisor that I know who has uh, branches in 35 jurisdictions around the world. Wow. There's another guy who I know who's got, um, who's just opened up uh, an office in Singapore and that's his ninth uh, jurisdiction. There's another guy who I know who was at the FPA conference last year, Phil Billingham, and he's got an office in the UK, in um, South Africa and in uh, New York in the US. Now, you know, one of XY's uh, members, Brett Evans and his uh, um, partner, oh my goodness, James Wrigley. Is it James Wrigley? Yes. James Wrigley. Well I mean, they're going great guns and, and taking over the planet uh, with uh, oh. Atlas Wealth Management. I recommended yeah, just, them. I recommended someone go visit them just two days ago. Yeah. Um, and there's Adam, there's Adam Turk as well with Harborside Capital who's doing great work as well. And I think we've been sucked in by product manufacturers and licensees. But unfortunately, because we've had, we haven't had a great big... Um, we haven't had a strength in technical resources, in strategic resources, and they've accounted for the lowest common denominator. Yes. So that it's, um, you can't give advice on this area. You can't give advice in this area. And quite frankly, um, why should they allow their advisors, their, dare I say, and I hate using this word, their distribution force yeah. um, to do so when these guys, they don't want to study? So let me ask you a question, Clayton. And, yes. Um, so we all know what the sole purpose test is, right? Yep. Because it's been smashed into us with the fees from superannuation and all that sort of stuff, okay? Yep. Now we all know the section, we all know the chapter and verse and all this sort of stuff and everything. But if I asked you a question, if I said to you, um, what is the concessional contribution gap? Oh, okay. Um, well, it changes every year. Um, to be, to, to, prime ministers, but that's another story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, uh, I mean, I haven't looked at it in the last twelve it's months, but I'm guessing, I'm guessing it's around thirty grand. Yeah, okay, so twenty-five. Twenty-five grand. grand. But why is it twenty-five grand? Now, I've asked this specific question to lots and lots and lots of advisors over the last twelve months, and they look at me and they go, "Oh, because the government changed the rules." And I said, oh, "I understand." Oh, wait, the rules. wait. So you're you're talking about the formula of of the no no? Okay, I'm asking. Cool. How lawyers get, how lawyers have become the uh, the preferred method, and Will Johns is a great another another great another example of a great advisor who understands the law, both a disability studies and contract law perspective. The advisors who seem to have not as much success with claims, um, it's because they look at the emotive reason why insurance companies should pay claims. But insurance companies have processes, have contracts, have definitions. So why lawyers have been successful is lawyers understand the law. Lawyers understand contract law. And effectively, when a, um, a TPD or a, when an insurance payment hasn't been paid, for all intents and purposes, it could be deemed as a breach of contract. Now, they know and understand this, just as we know that a concessional contribution cap is $25,000, but what chapter and verse of legislation is it? Ooh, chapter and verse of, it's one of many, mate. I don't know. But this is what I'm saying, is that we go to these conferences and these PD days and we hear the budget. You know, I'm a budget nerd and I, you know, I'm sitting in front of the TV and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm watching <laughs> and I absorb all the information that comes out of the budget. Just by the by, if you guys set up an event where we can go into the lockdown rooms for these large investment houses and, and tech houses, I'm the first person to sign up and be there. I'd love to be in one of those rooms. But that just shows the extent of my my uh, my social existence, so we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
why I think, you know, things like um, having a professional year and having um, mentoring and coaching is so important because um, it makes sure that the next generation of advisors and not so much advisors because there are a lot of good guys, a lot of good people who are going to be power planners or investment analysts or um, insurance claims management or, um, or underwriters or, you know, insert box, insert words, practice managers. Um, can you imagine Clayton and to, you know, and you know, the, the, the other people out there listening to this, why is there have been so much emphasis on financial advice education, but there's been no emphasis about power planning education, about insurance education. Now I've yeah. taught insurance risk management at uni. I've taught it and it has nothing to do with insurance mismanagement, nothing to do with it. <laughs> the universities, seriously, the what universities, well, there's no conversation about um, loadings, exclusions, no conversation about what is T- what, what even is TPD? What's it about? It's about um, you have to do a risk needs analysis. This is how much your mortgage is. These are how much your debts are. This is how much this is. This is how much it is. But that's not insurance. The guys, the, the, the old school riskies who learnt about insurance use a risk needs analysis as a means to an end. Yes. But what they were very exceptionally, exceptionally good at, and I remember having a chat with Glenn James about this, what they were exceptionally, exceptionally good at was knowing the ins and outs and ups and downs of their policy and what paid and why, they, and why you would use one policy over the other. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. And isn't that the same thing as knowing and understanding the particular se- uh, section, chapter and verse of uh, the concessional contribution cap and why it's $25,000? Oof, you're probably right. I remember interviewing uh, Sam Henderson. He said uh, if he could redo his time, he'd probably read the Corpse Act <laughs> and uh, see how it affected his business. So I, I think you're probably right, mate. Yeah, I probably just took it as um, I probably just took it for granted that you know I learnt from somewhere that uh, whatever that year's concessional contribution cap was, and I and and then there was you know some level of. Um, there was was some level of formula between the non-concessional and the concessional. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it was like six or seven times or something like that. And that's, that's how they sort of calculated the the non-concessional. But um, yeah, you're you're, you're probably right. It's it's one of the things, one of the many things I think uh, to know, uh, to learn over the course of becoming a financial planner. And it's, it's, it's so interesting because, you know, if I, if I look back maybe uh, 10 years and, um, and I was just sort of getting out of, you know, I was merging out of tax accounting and into power planning. And, um, and if I sort of look at the cohort that I've come through with, um, that I've met during the years and the, the type of advisor that I, I see is out there, it's actually really well educated. Um, they've got their marketing down pat. They've got their sales down pat. They've got their operations down pat. There's a, really quite capable people and it's um it's not necessarily that they belong to to this age group i think just the expectation was higher it's a post fofa world it's uh, everyone you know it's just the the expectation has been elevated um and i i have a lot of i have a lot of sort of um empathy for the people that have operated in a certain environment People like yourself seem to adapt quite well and seem to bounce quite well and, you know, have, have the mind like a teapot, for example. But um, many others don't quite have that. And I have a lot of empathy for them because, I mean, at some stage, and I feel like it's coming around relatively shortly. I mean, my wife's 22 weeks pregnant. I'm about to, you know, I'm not too far away from becoming a dad for the first time. And I feel like my set in stone-esque is just around the corner and, uh, and, and, and sort of, you know, shifting a lot of things, whether it's operations or whether it's how I sell or it's how I market or it's how I give advice. You know, there's so many different things that are in flux at the moment that I have a lot of empathy for those that have gone through it. But I will say that the, the, the level of people of advisor of just let, let's call it of a, of a professional service person, the level of the professional service person has increased in advice I've seen over sort of the last five to 10 years. And, um, and all this professional year, I'm kind of, 
I'm bullish on, you know, like it's something yeah. that should have existed for a long time. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I'm, a, I'm a little bit disappointed that there's not more clarification around what that looks like and how to, how, you know, more advisors can, because I know many advisors that say, yeah, we don't know what to do. So we're not doing anything yet. Someone needs to come well, why along. Don't you just, part of the problem is that part of the problem we have is I think, and I'm, I'm guilty uh, for this as well, is should we invest time, effort, energy, resources in building something only to be told, don't? Yeah. Or only to be told, that thing that you did, you can't do. Yeah. Um, but I'm not so sure that that approach is even appropriate. I feel it would be better, and uh, I feel it would be better to steam forward um, and build some sort of um, uh, program and we're all going to, and I know that I can't swear on this, so I won't. No, um, please do. Gonna, go for it. It's all yours. We're all going to fuck up on this in any case. <laughs> so, um, and it, that's just part of growth. I mean, you're yeah. going to go through, you know, you're going through, you and your um, your wife are going through one of the most extraordinary experience in human, level, human evolution. Yeah. You know, it's, you are bringing um, new life into this world. Okay? Crazy. And new life is painful. New life involves change. Uh, new new life involves a change in paradigm, how we think, our habits, our shopping. If you reckon the coronavirus changed your shopping habits, mate, wait till you start uh, <laughs> realising what you really have to buy and what really is important as opposed to what you should be buying. But that's what do you a, mean? You know, Toilet paper? Story. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I'm really, um, like you, I'm very, very bullish about our future. Uh, and not just only on an Australian perspective, I'm really mm. bullish about this on a global perspective. Now, Zurich recently did some research about um, how they could quantify the value of advice because all the inquiries and Royal Commission and all this sort of stuff have been talking about cost. Yes. And cost is a race to the bottom. That's yes. It. But value is not a race to the bottom. What we have to be very, very good at is how do we continue to quantify the value of advice yes um and uh, zurich's uh, research showed that the relationship with an advisor um, either adds or saves 4.4 percent over a particular period of time uh, to a client's portfolio now that's no different from mentoring it's no different to a professional year yeah. because yeah. In the conversations I've had with you, and I'm not, uh, I'm quite happy to say this, I've learned a lot from you, Clayton. And vice versa. Um, because, um, you know, we've had some interesting conversations over time. <laughs> <laughs> and you've often said to me, no, mate, this is not how it's done. It's done like this. And what I then have to do is um, uh, get off my high horse and get off my what I think and, and forcibly change my paradigm. Um, because that's just how it is. Um, and I think if we, as you said, if we not so much become better marketers, I think uh, um, knowledge professionals, which is what I think the um, financial advice profession is, uh, I think knowledge professionals by their very, um, by what we do, are good marketers. But I think that we're crap at articulation. We have, we're getting better, but yes, yes. Um, and um, I think some of the work, a lot of the work that, um, you know, various industry organizations and um, like yourselves are doing is that you are continuing to highlight the benefits that advice brings to the community. But what I find, you know, quite fascinating, quite, quite fascinating is that after, after any traumatic event in Australia, the FPA and the AFA launch their um, pro bono the FPA and the AFA and several licenses have gone into arrangements with the Cancer Council and whatnot in providing uh, pro bono advice. Why aren't these being screamed from the absolute highest rooftops? Yeah, well, I think... Because if, because if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. Yeah, it's... Um, I think because, I mean, a lot of, a lot of stuff, people have really good intentions and, and um, probably just as as the reality rolls out, it doesn't match the expectation would be my assumption. Um, if, a, if a client or their family, and this goes into the work that we do in the estate planning space, most people don't know what they know. 
And there's a bloke who I know in Adelaide. He's a partner of, I think he's founder of a practice called Barton's in Adelaide, where they specialize in providing advice to medicos. And I remember him delivering a talk in Orlando, I think it was. And he said, people don't, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're uh, news hungry or not, maybe not so much news hungry, but we are tabloid hungry, if you like. Unfortunately, yes. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. it does. And, 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 and I think the better that we get at, uh, the, you know, and, and when I say we should become better marketers, what I, and, and thanks for pulling me up on that, probably, probably what I'm trying to get at is become better value-based marketers, letting people know what we do, letting people know how it improves their life, letting people know that even if technically if they spent five years trying to figure this all out, they could probably mm. do it themselves, but do they really mm. want to? Do they have the time? Is that the best use of their effort and time and focus? Or should they go to a trip to Rome with their family? You know, it, that's, it, that's fascinating, fascinating yeah. because um, I, I think you know my dear old dad is not well. He's... Um, He's losing a battle with Alzheimer's and dementia. And uh, one of the things that he said to me many years ago uh, was, uh, son, if it's important to you, find the time. I wish I, it's, uh, that's, it's hard to argue. That's it. <laughs> because right now I can, I could probably, you know, if I was to take a, um, a microscope or a telescope into you and your uh, um, family situation, you don't have time for a baby. Probably not. No, but you're doing it. <laughs> Yeah, because we ran out of time. I, 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 I got to 36 years old and I went, oh, God, okay, I guess it's time. Because, you know, I'm I mean, sure it's okay, fantastic. Well, I guess what I'm saying is that we say, oh, someone else will do it. And I've been mm. guilty of this. Um, you know, oh, uh, someone else will do this or I don't have the time or this or that or the cup broke. Yeah. Um, yeah. But really? So to, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure whether you and I have spoken about this, but I've, um, I'm, I'm very bullish about what it is that we do. I'm very, very, I'm, it's no secret that people know that I'm very, very passionate about our profession and not just in an Australian perspective, in a global perspective as well. And this is why I'm also not, so, not only so passionate about delivering advice to, I guess, mum and dad consumer, but also uh, making sure that, the infrastructure, which is the professional year, which is the coaching, which is the mentoring, which is the education. If mum and dad can uh, seek advice from better accredited, better qualified, better experienced, uh, more empathetic, more knowledgeable, you know, insert words, advisor, whether it's here or overseas, then isn't that really a good thing? Yeah. And this goes to the study that Zurich did where um, like all, all this market, you know, as Haley uh, said, all this investment wobble, the market wobble that we're having, um, people are getting nervous uh, and people are buying toilet paper. Goodness <laughs> gracious me. Um, but isn't it better to, uh, to have these active um, communications, not only with clients, but with, your, with people in the business, um, yeah. with, you know, people in the, in the community to to help them. And I don't really believe, I mean, one of the things that I've um, struggling to wrap around my head is the concept of informed consent. Oh yeah. This is how do you and inform I'll, someone, right? Like I'll, I'll, fully I'll informed. That is a tough, it, yeah, it's a tough position because what informed consent I believe, and I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, what informed consent seems to uh, push towards is that a client understands. Yeah, fully understands as well. But if you if you look at the words um, very very carefully, does informed consent means that the client fully understands, or does informed consent mean that we as professionals have fully explained something? It's a good point. So isn't it then our responsibility as a profession, whether we're here, whether we're overseas, whether we're whether we're giving, whether we're providing advice, or you know, whether we're put, you know, bricklaying. Not that there's nothing wrong with bricklayers. But the, um, isn't it our isn't it our professional responsibility to know our stuff so well um, that we can explain the ins and outs and ups and downs? And again, this is my Sheldon, this my right brain thing. How I learn is 
if you think about the equation, one plus one equals two, it's easy to teach someone one plus one equals two um, because you're solving for two, you're solving for two. But what's the relationship of the first one and the second one and the plus and the equals? And we have to be able to know and understand the relationship of the equation that all ends. And this then goes into not only the, pro the professional year coaching and mentoring of our colleagues, of those people in our practice, but isn't it then uh, us providing that same professional year in coaching in every single meeting we have with a client? Yeah, it's a very good point. Our, our, our job is either to learn or to teach. And I think the standard is very high. I think if, if, if clients really did have total informed consent, technically, you know, let, let's scope out financial advice for a moment. Let's say uh, it's building a house and, and they give total informed consent of, of the house getting built. If they fully understand how that house is getting built, uh, well, it's how, you know, how, how are they going to understand that you need to go 12 meters deep to set up the foundations? And like, I, I know nothing of construction, but for me to say that I can, I can say that, that the builder has done a really good job in explaining it to me. But I mean, it's a high precedent. And I think this is probably a discussion that we'll have over many years. Um, Harry, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's, been you, an absolute, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've been looking forward to this uh, for years and I'm glad we finally made it happen. Um, for all the advisors out there that, that want to reach out and say hi for any number of reasons, I know you're overly generous with, with your help and your time. Um, how, how, Always would, here. how would someone go about contacting you? Very difficult to get a hold of me on a mobile um, because I very rarely answer it these days. Um, very difficult to get a hold of me at the office because that's why we employ people to act as gatekeepers. But I also, well, that's, that's how it is basically. I always answer my messages. So uh, SMS messages, uh, always answer LinkedIn. Um, um, unfortunately spend too much time on social media. So the, I guess if they're, um, if it's important enough, I'll find the time and we'll find the time to, to make that conversation, but I'm always available, always always available i've been very fortunate very very fortunate in my uh, not only my career but um my life in um, having great having access to great mentors um, access to people who uh, took me under their wings sometimes voluntarily sometimes forcibly me forcibly um, <laughs> and um and then gave me a boot up the you know what um when it was when sometimes when it was necessary sometimes when i thought it wasn't necessary and that's just uh, formed the, uh, the the person that I am today. Um, so I, it's important that we um, we give back. Uh, it's important, and this is why, again, I'm uh, passionate about uh, the coaching and the mentoring and the education and um, having interns come into the practice, uh, sharing, uh, collaborating, coaching, whatever those words are. Um, now... Um, I can't possibly begin to tell you how amazing this vocation has been for me. It's been um, as uh, amazing um, in its positive experiences as has been in its sometimes the most traumatic of experiences. And I won't say negative because sometimes in the, uh, when um, in the darkest moments um, when we're dealing with clients and family and friends um, who are experiencing death and pain, uh, it's in those sorts of circumstances we find that we grow the most. Um, so uh, on that note, I also want to express a deep level of gratitude to uh, you, mate, and to your uh, colleagues at XY. And I'm uh, just a little bit pissed off that I didn't think of it myself first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. <laughs> mate, we wouldn't be here without you, let me guarantee you, because we're facilitators um, more than anything else. And, um, and if it wasn't people answering intelligently and, and driving the positive evolution of financial advice, then we would have ceased many, many years ago. So uh, with, with many thanks for, for being a part of the community for so long. But um, again, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so glad I can finally tick this, uh, this guest off my list. So I appreciate you, you, you spending the time. Hopefully mate. one of many, mate. Done. Cheers, mate. Thanks so much. Cheers, buddy. Have a great one.